Well, good morning, and uh, welcome to, from Burford Church uh, this morning at 9.30 for us. Let me apologize, I had the live stream on my computer, which you were then picking up. Good morning. It, it, that really does tell you that we are indeed live here in Burford Church at 9.30 this morning. It's great to have you uh, with us for our service of common worship. We begin with a moment of quiet, and let me pray for us. Gracious Father, we thank you that we are able to gather that whilst we are separated physically, we pray that you might unite us in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to give you praise and worship and adoration this morning, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Our opening hymn is Hail to the Lord's Anointed, Great David's Greater Son. Let's sing.
Well, good morning to those of you who have joined us. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to receive and hear God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. And as we reflect on this past week, on our past lives, we recognise that we have not honoured him as we ought to. And now we have an opportunity to restore that relationship with our gracious Heavenly Father. So let us turn away from sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. So together we pray. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So may the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We come now to our psalm, Psalm 29, a psalm that encourages us to praise the Lord for his greatness and that all should join in that praise. So why don't you join in the words that will appear on the screen. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap, leap like a calf, Siron like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We're in the middle of a series looking at questions that Jesus asked, and our next one comes from Mark chapter 8, and Stephen Price is going to bring that for us. Mark's Gospel chapter 8, commencing to read at verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. 
He spake plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. Let's pray before we think about this passage from Mark's Gospel together. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, Lord Jesus, who saves us from our sins by your death on the cross and who gives us great hope by your rising again from the dead. Lord, give us great joy in those wonderful truths this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I wonder if you've ever said or heard this phrase before. It was the best thing ever. We quite often say that, don't we? Often children say that. Wow, that trip to the seaside or that roller coaster or whatever it was or that film was the best thing ever. But obviously that's a little bit of an exaggeration. But I wonder what you would consider to actually be the best thing ever. What would people say if they were asked? What's the best thing that could possibly happen? What would be the best thing ever? Well, I think probably people would say something along the lines of, well, to make all the wrongs right, to make all the relationships between every person right, to get rid of all suffering, all pandemics, all evil. And Christians believe that exact thing has been made possible. And it happened as a result of what we heard from verse 31 of our reading that Stephen just read. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed, and after three days, rise again. When Jesus was killed, he took upon himself the punishment for all wrong, and brought about justice. He rose again to get rid of death and suffering, and to open up the gates of heaven for us, that place where tears and crying and suffering and pandemics will be no more. So what Jesus was about to go through was literally the best thing ever. And this amazing thing that Jesus was about to do had been predicted in the Old Testament. Those prophets said that a Messiah, God's anointed king, would come and would bring about the best thing that could ever happen. And so Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter quite rightly answers, you are this predicted Messiah. Wonderful confession of who Jesus really is, about to bring about this wonderful, wonderful event. But then verse 32 happens. Peter listens to Jesus' revelation of what he's come to earth to do, to be the Messiah, God's unique king. And Peter's reaction is, sorry, Jesus, but that's not what you're here to do. That's not what Messiah does. He takes him to one side and Peter tells Jesus off. He rebukes him, our passage says. Now, we don't know the words of Peter's rebuke, and that's quite helpful, actually, as we'll see in a moment, because the important thing is not exactly what Peter said, but the fact that he said to Jesus, I don't think, Jesus, that that's what you should be doing. And then comes Jesus' reaction in verse 33. It strikes us as a bit harsh, doesn't it? Get behind me, Satan. Very strong words from Jesus. But let's think about why Jesus would say such a thing to Peter. Remember that Jesus is about to bring about the best thing that could ever possibly happen. So the ultimate good is about to become a reality. And Peter says, no, I don't think that should happen. If Jesus' set purpose to die for the sins of the world, to rise again, to give us eternal life, is the best thing that could ever happen, what does that mean for anything that contradicts or hinders this best thing ever? Do you see, the more worthy the cause, the more disastrous the hindrance of that cause. How do you feel if you see somebody um, on the road blocking an ambulance, not moving out of the way when the ambulance is coming through? Why does that seem so wrong? Well, because that person is blocking the saving of a life. How much more terrible then is it to block the saving of many lives for all eternity? It may sound harsh at first, but when we recognize the height of the stakes here, we can see why Jesus would say such a thing to Peter. And look at what Jesus then says in, in verse 33. He says, your thinking is not from God. 
Peter. It's not the real thing, it's counterfeit. You think your cause is justified, but it's just a fake. Now, there are many counterfeit causes out there in the world, many fakes that we can think is the best thing ever, but actually isn't. What are some of the ones that are available to us today? Well, there's the idea that perhaps total equality would be the best thing ever. If only we could bring that about, that would be the best thing that could possibly happen. Maybe it's ridding the world of all poverty. That would be the number one best thing ever. Or perhaps saving all um, the environment or stopping all war. Now, these are all good things, don't get me wrong. But they can't be the number one best thing ever. That's why it's a good thing we didn't know what Peter said to Jesus. So we can say Peter took to Jesus to one side and said to him, actually, Jesus, I think this is the best thing that could possibly happen, not what you're saying. And so that earned him the Satan retort from Jesus to show the seriousness of contradicting Jesus' one and only best ever world-saving plan. Now, we all in our hearts can be a bit like Peter, I think. I know I can. Jesus said clearly in our passages today what he is all about. And so if we, as his followers, contradict the contents of verse 31 that we've just been thinking about as Jesus' ultimate purpose, to die for sins, to rise again, then we're doing a Peter. Jesus asks each of us, who do you say that I am? And I'm afraid this is completely black and white. The answer to that question is either right or it's wrong. There's only one answer to that question, that Jesus is the Messiah who came to die and to rise again. So who do you say Jesus is? What do you think his ultimate purpose is? Remember that Jesus came to do the best thing ever, to save us from our sins, to rise again, to open the gates of heaven for us. And so that means that we need to beware of these um, counterfeit world-saving plans, these messages that we hear from the world, from perhaps things we read in the newspaper or online that promise to be the number one best thing ever. We've got to remember that Jesus' message here to us is the best thing ever, that he will die on the cross for our sins. He will rise again to bring us to heaven. And if we contradict, deny, or hinder that, then we can expect a great rebuke from God like Jesus did. But let's not fail to see the wood for the trees here. What we've just heard from the words of Jesus is a wonderful, golden message, the best thing that's ever happened, that Jesus would die to mean that we would never have to suffer the consequences of our sins and would rise again to give us eternal life. What a wonderful, joyful message that is to the whole world. And so we're now going to have our next song which is going to remind us and ask that the Lord would fill our hearts with joy and gladness at this wonderful message that Jesus has done the best thing that could ever happen. And so now we will sing our next song.
Jesus asked that question, who do you say that I am? And maybe you'd be interested in exploring that question for yourself. We have a course beginning this coming Tuesday uh, called Alpha. If you'd like details, if you'd like to be in touch with the church office, either by phone or by email, churchoffice at birthofchurch.org. We'd love to put you in touch uh, as you seek to explore the answer to that question. Uh, who do you say that I am? But for those of us who know and trust in our uh, God as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, an opportunity for us to reaffirm our faith together. And so together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come now to pray. And first of all, we'll pray that collect for the first Sunday of Epiphany, and then Andrew Lord will lead us in our intercessions. Together we pray. Eternal Father, who at the baptism of Jesus revealed him to be your Son, anointing him with the Holy Spirit. Grant to us who are born again by water and the Spirit that we may be faithful to our calling as your adopted children. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let us pray. Our gracious God, Father, we thank you that we can come before you this morning. And Father, we want to rejoice in you. We want to rejoice in your goodness, to rejoice in your mercy, to rejoice in your power, to rejoice in your love, to rejoice that you are the sovereign God who is over all and above all. But Father, most of all, we come to rejoice in the gift of your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that as we come before you this morning, we come as those whose eyes have been opened to see that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God. Father, we thank you that we can celebrate his coming. We can celebrate his life. And Father, we thank you that Jesus is alive forever, that he is seated even at thy right hand now, in power and in glory and that he ever lives to intercede for his people. Father, we thank you for Jesus. And yet as we come before you this morning, we confess that so often we fail to understand him fully. Lord, we pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts and minds, that we may see more of the wonder and the splendor and the majesty and the depth and the height of the love of Christ. Help us to appreciate him in all his saving glory. Help us to look to him and to trust in him in all situations and in all circumstances. Father, we thank you that we have a savior. We thank you that we do not live in our own strength, but we can lean upon him. 
We thank you that he is our good shepherd who knows the sheep, who leads the sheep, who provides for the sheep, and even who dies for the sheep. Father, we pray that we may walk more closely with Jesus. We pray that we may ever listen to his voice. We pray that we may be obedient to him. We pray that we may follow closely after him. And we pray that we may be those that model Christ in this world. Help us, Father, by the working of your Spirit to change us, to be more like the Lord Jesus. Help us to reflect his glory. Help us to be lights that shine in the darkness. Help us to be faithful in our witness and in our testimony for Christ. Father, we do pray for your church here in Burford. We think as well of the work in Fulbrook and in Tainton, in Astle and Swinbrook and in Whitford. Father, we pray for an outpouring of your spirit. We pray that you'd encourage your people. We pray that you would bless the ministry in these places. We pray for a saving of souls. We pray for an extension of your kingdom. We pray that many would be gathered in who might know and love and serve and trust in the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for Tom and for Oliver that you would encourage and strengthen and bless them as they seek to work in the ministry in these places. And Father, we pray for the rest of the ministry and support team, that you would encourage and bless and strengthen them in their labors, that in all things they may seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness and seek to make Jesus known, the one hope, the one truth, the one life. Father, have mercy, we pray. And Father, we do pray for those that have particular needs this morning. And we do think of our dear brother Roland, and we lift him up before you this morning. Father, we pray that you would be near to him. We pray that you would encourage him as he mourns the loss of Rosemary. Father, we pray that you would be his strength, that you would be his rock, that you would be his fortress, that you would be his strong tower, that he might know the peace and presence of God. Father, we thank you for him and for his faith. And we thank you for Rosemary as well and for her faith. Lord, we pray your blessing upon the whole family at this time. May you encourage, strengthen, and bless them in your love. Father, we pray for your servants. We pray for your people in need at this time. We think of others who have been bereaved. We think of others who are sick. We think of those who suffer in body and in mind. Lord, draw near to them and strengthen them, we pray. Lord, we thank you that you're the God of all comfort. We thank you that we can cast our cares upon you because you care for us. Lord, bless and look after the flock, we pray. Father, we pray for our nation at this time. We pray for our government, our royal family. We pray for those in authority over us. We pray that you would guide them and lead them. We pray, Father, that they would look to you and look to your leading and your help and your strength in this time of trouble. We pray for the NHS and those that seek to minister in these difficult times. Lord, may you bless them and may they too seek their strength and their help from you. Father, bless our nation, we pray. Guide us and lead us. Be with us in this hour of need, we pray. And we pray for the nations of the world. Look in mercy upon us, we ask. Father, we thank you that you are the Lord that reigns, the God who is seated eternally upon the throne, the God who is all-powerful and all-majestic. Father, have mercy upon us, we ask. Father, we do pray for our mission partners this morning. We think particularly of the work of Beesom and of CAP as they seek to alleviate the suffering of those who are poor and needy. Father, may they be blessed in their labors and may we be diligent in our support. 
may we be those that minister to others and help in the cause of Christ, we pray. Lord, bless us, we ask, as we look to you, as we praise you, as we thank you, and as we worship you, in the precious and glorious and wonderful name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We draw our prayers to a close this morning by saying together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Andrew, thank you for leading us in our prayers. You are the Christ, and the Christ deserves worship and praise. Our closing hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let's sing. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. It's great uh, to be together to hear from God's Word and to pray and to sing. We'd love you to join us for our coffee time that begins in about 15 minutes or so on Zoom. Uh, if you've got e-news, the details are there. We'd love you to join us um, from people from right across the benefice. Hopefully you'll be joining us at 20 past 10 uh, for half an hour or so. But as we close, let us say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.